Yo, what's going on YouTube? It's GZTV. I currently have my work pants on. I'm a little uncomfortable, but I work at noon and it's like 1020. So I'm going to get this video out for you guys super duper quickly so I don't have to worry about content later on. Uh, but yeah, we're just going to talk about the eighth episode of you. We're kind of back watching it. We might actually do some double uploads with some episodes of this sprinkled in there this week because I think the conference finals is going to end in the next couple of days. So let's just get straight into it. So, you know, when we, I have a theory here going into this, you know, if anyone has to say I'm happy, uh, to themselves over and over again, I don't think they're happy and, and keep that in mind because that's, that's a special thing here. That's a very important thing here. So three months have passed since the breakup and Joe is allegedly a changed man. Peppy music plays in the background of a shiny, smiley relationship with Karen, my little neat freak, who organizes Joe's books alphabetically. I mean, this is perfect for him. He likes books. He likes being neat. He likes a put-together person. Uh, remember how Beck was incapable of sorting books? Uh, those of us who get Joe can tell this is doomed from the jump because Karen has inexcusably red state taste in television. Joe couldn't stomach The Bachelor, so just think of what having the King of Queens playing in his apartment does to his tender psyche. And suggest that Joe invest in a Kindle. A Kindle? I mean, are you, are you kidding me right now? You think Joe's the type of guy to pick up a Kindle? This isn't going to go well. So, Joe has stopped doing his kind of next-level spy shit, and is just internet stalking back like your average hung-up ex. I mean, it's a pretty average story. Googling her to discover what she, that she wrote a piece called What to Wear to Your Best Friend's Funeral that went viral and has since landed a book deal, which, yeah, that checks out, you know. Uh, Joe has cut himself off so completely, he's only looking at Beck's Facebook three times a day. Wow, Joe. What a, what an accomplishment. He keeps his hands busy by rubbing Karen's feet while she watches terrible CBS sitcoms. Meanwhile, uh, Beck is reading the comments and in Peach's absence has escalated her friendship with Blythe. You know, Blythe is obviously a very critical person. She's going to help Beck with her writing career and you don't really mind this. Obviously, Beck is a, or Blythe as a character gets kind of annoying and a bit arrogant sometimes. But in terms of helping someone's writing career, she is perfect. This doesn't really work for Lynn, um, who, who cannot hang, but it's really working, you know, for the viewers, as a lot of Blythe's dialogue is pretty awesome. I think it's pretty entertaining. She apologizes for being late to the drinks with, there's this essay in The Believer that would not let go of me, and encourages Beck to turn her home into a writer's colony by surrendering all earthly distractions, namely social media and also the internet. Which is pretty normal. I feel like most writers kind of do that when they're getting ready to write a piece. You know, you kind of have to do something like that. Especially when you have a book deal and you can't really fuck this up, you know? So, Beck frets about how the public will panic as she goes dark. And Blith, who is perfect, kills that fantasy with, You're not J.K. Rowling. People aren't going to care if you leave social media. You're not quite at that status as a writer. I think you can kind of stow yourself away for a while and write in a, write a piece. So, Beck writes for a few minutes and does 10,000 yoga stretches before plugging her router back in so she can stalk Joe's new girlfriend. I mean, we're, we're, in an era, we're in an age of the internet. People can't resist staying off their phones. It's not a thing, really. Uh, because, of course, you know, Beck, who cannot stress this enough, is supposed to be a fiction writer, moseys over to Joe's neighborhood to accidentally, on purpose, bump into Joe and Karen. And then, when asked what she's doing in the area, does not even have a story prepared. I mean, Beck, what are you doing, man? I mean, this is just dumb on her part. Obviously, it works, somehow works out in the end. Um, taking a walk around the block, I guess. I mean, come on. What is she doing, man? Not the brightest move on her part. It makes her look clingy and makes her look desperate. Uh, Beck claims to be listening to a podcast Joe recommended. Karen says podcasts are just droning. I mean, there's not really a lie there. She's kind of right. But any appearance of coupled bliss is botched when Joe gets caught using that, that most basic, horrific babe. Catches him in the act. And it's like, oh, I thought we didn't like that. I thought we were making fun of people that used that word. So, Beck sees her opening and texts Joe, who has his read receipts on. Quite an amateur. And faster than you can say, this is not what Peach died for. Beck sending Joe potential author photos and setting such a desperate thirst traps i'm honestly embarrassed for joe that they worked i mean this really shows like a a strike in his character this shows like a weakness in his character that that worked on you 
But uh, the show continues to waste John Stamos on these kind of boring interstitials where he extra narrates the show. We already have a narrator, and tries but fails to get Beck and Joe to make better decisions. And I'm not really sure why he hasn't picked up on this yet. People, Two people that are kind of seeing him at the same time are asking about relationship advice and the mouse in the trap thing. It's weird that he hasn't really figured that out yet. That maybe Joe is not gay, because he isn't. I... It was funny when he when he said I have great metaphors. That was a funny moment in the episode. Uh, Beck widens to stay must that Joe's new girlfriend puts stickers on pictures and other such appalling transgressions. Meanwhile, Joe explains Ronaldo and I used to make fun of people who said babe. I mean, don't we all though? I feel like that's a pretty fucking cliche thing to say. It makes sense that you would make fun of that. So Beck and Joe can't avoid each other because the only couple on you that you know you root for as a viewer. Ethan and Blythe, right now, are moving in together, and even though Blythe seems like the sort of person who would hire movers, they enlist Beck and Joe to move boxes and bump knees all day. I mean, wow, what a fucking perfect opportunity, what a golden opportunity for Beck, who seems like the desperate one, but at the same time, Joe is kind of feeding into that narrative, too. Later, Beck gets Joe to meet her on the Circle Line boat to read her pages because she needs both edits and a sea breeze. I mean, are you kidding? Like, what is Joe doing? Why would he do this knowing he's in a relationship? I mean, this whole episode, you're realizing how shitty of a person Joe is. So obviously they have sex on this empty ter- tourist vessel, and Joe barely waits until Beck has climbed off his lap before blurting out, that was a mistake. And then they have sex a bunch more times. They meet up a bunch more times, because he has to help her write, I guess. I mean, she, he just has to do that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. What do, what do you all, I mean, what do you all make of the whole stairwell urchins mom plot line? I mean, I feel like she's gotten more involved. Uh, to me, it feels like it was scooped up from the cutting room floor off of some other Lifetime show and shoved into this one, too. I, I, I don't know what exactly. I don't know what that did. It really is kind of pointless. Obviously, you see more Claudia. You see more of Paco, which is cool, but uh, make this episode feel a million hours long, I guess. Um, we, we know virtually nothing about Claudia, the mom, especially that she is a nurse and an addict with an abusive boyfriend who she can't let out of her life. It's that very toxic relationship they've built with each other. It is sad and strange and sort of gratuitous. Uh, what are we learning here? That your soundproof torture-slash-murder dungeon can, in a pinch, serve as a safe place to detox? That Karen is a good friend and Joe is a shitty person who cheats on his girlfriend with his ex to the detriment of all his other relationships? We already know Joe is a bad person. We don't need to know this anymore. We have matched him, watched him kill two people. I guess the only takeaways here are one, Ron is back. Ron is back, and two, the hallway ragamuffin is angry with Joe now that Ron has returned. I guess it's his fucking fault. You know, deal with your own fucking family problems, buddy. Have your mom fucking changed as a person. I don't know. I mean, you're obviously a little young for that, but still. So. At Blythe and Ethan's Swedish word for a housewarming party, Karen tells Beck how amazing Joe is. I mean, they're having a private conversation about each other as he's, you know, going away and, like, opening bottles of wine and stuff. Uh, it just makes Beck miss him more, and it makes her more jealous. I, I guess that's the idea with Karen here. Even though she's a very good person deep down, you know, she's kind of an asshole for this. And Blythe tells Joe, personally, I am of the opinion that all penetration under patriarchy is rape. I mean, what? Karen gets in Beck's head, and Beck, developing a conscience for a hot second, breaks things off with Joe. Let's face it, I am no good for you, but Karen Minty is. I'm sorry, it is hilarious that they insist on referring to her as Karen Minty. They kind of create a thing for her there. Uh, This is very desperate for Beck. Uh, No one else in the show is named Karen, so why are we using your last name, though? Uh, It's not like they need to clarify which Karen they mean. Joe's been dating her for three months. I mean, she's a pretty new character on the show. She just got introduced, I think, one or two episodes ago. As a very, like, small side plot when Joe gets back to his apartment. So Joe goes home, and something about the sight of Karen giggling at Kevin James and giving herself a pedicure announces to Joe that their relationship must end. And obviously that's a little exaggerated because I don't think that's the reason why he ended the relationship. I think he just saw something in Beck. They had that conversation. He was like, okay, I I, I don't know if I can, you know, do this. So he says it's over. He says, which pretty rude to not give her a reason, not even have a build up to the breakup. Uh, Karen tells him, do not talk for a minute, please. And then just, she just coolly collects all her belongings and bounces. 
you know, you like Karen a lot for that. You like her as a character a lot for that. She's a, she's being a bigger person. You know, you, not a lot of people can accept rejection, can accept a breakup like that. Get as far away from Joe as you can. I mean, that's a great move on her part. So Joe sprints across town, breaks Beck's windows, and all but bursts into You Belong With Me outside her door. What a thrilling reunion. What a weird, forced Romeo Juliet esque reconcile. Uh, now it's Karen's turn to just be in the neighborhood. So she she tells Beck, I just had to thank you. I owe you. Turns out you're my get out of Joe free card. You showed me who he really is. But she saved her best stick for last. Just be careful. I've got a feeling you're no Candace. So it seems like, wow. Seems like, wow, Karen has really looked into Joe's personal life and saw this Karen figure. Um, or this Candace figure. Fuck. Candace figure. You've got to know what he did to me. One of these days he's going to do to you too. Maybe he'll do whatever he did to Candace. So, murder? We're not really sure what he's done to Candace. We're still trying to kind of figure that out. That's still a pretty big mystery on the show. But yeah, I'm still hoping it's something more interesting than just he killed her. But maybe that's what you has done to, to the audience. It kind of makes you numb to homicide as a plot device. Like, oh, I don't want to see that anymore. That's not cool enough. You know, they keep throwing more and more interesting things, more and more interesting ways for characters to die off and whatnot on the show. And now it's like, eh, all of a sudden killing someone's like, okay. But, yeah, there's going to be a lot of plot lines moving forward. Obviously, Joe and Joe and Beck are back together. I'm, I don't know how long Claudia is going to be a part of the show anymore, given that Karen was kind of the lifeline for that storyline. But, obviously, Paco will still be around. We can look at Ethan and Blythe's relationship. We can look at this therapist. All this type of stuff. So, it's pretty cool. Obviously, you know, Peach was a huge, huge, like, momentum changer. Her dying, really. I, I Like, it made this show a little less uh, dramatic. But, yeah. Uh, that's all I have. Leave a like, comment, subscribe. I'm just going to throw this in a vid. Put it out for you guys real quick. I got to leave for work in, like, an hour 15. So, Got to get this together. If the NBA games are good tonight, I'll talk about it. But tomorrow, expect another U review. I'm not sure if I have work or not. They're kind of making my schedule on the spot. So we'll just kind of have to see how it goes. I am out. Have a good rest of your day. I don't think I'm all, um, working Friday, too. So you guys might get double uploads right before I leave for vacation. So peace.